My name is Sakela Butlungu from Pretoria, South Africa, and uh, I do research, among many other things, on trade unions. And today I'm, I want to talk to you about trade unions in Africa. Why are trade unions an important area for study and for research? At a time when trade unions elsewhere in the world are weak, insignificant, ignored, and politically very insignificant. Okay. I want to argue that trade unions in Africa have been a very, very important player in politics and, and in, in industrial relations from the beginning. And despite all the problems, they still are to this day. And my presentation is going to take you through some of the issues to make that point clear. I'm going to begin by talking about the origins of trade unions in Africa. Where do these trade unions come from? How did they come into being? I'm going to then talk about how trade unions, for example, emerged during the colonial period. If you like, trade unions in Africa are a creation of colonialism. They emerged during colonialism. And the unions I'm, I'm, I've been uh, doing research on are mainly uh, in former British and, 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 and French colonies. And in these colonies, these trade unions emerged um, they were formed in the first instance by immigrant white workers. Immigrant white workers who had moved to the colonies from the, home, from the metropolitan center to come and work in the colonies, either in, in administration, in the railways, and the other centers. And many of them were mainly supervisors and skilled workers in various fields. What happened then afterwards was that local workers, workers uh, uh, African workers then took up trade unionism themselves and formed their own trade unions separate from these other trade unions. And that's the story, therefore, of trade unions. Now, let's look at the sectors where trade unions first emerged. Trade unions emerged in the main, in teaching. They emerged in the public service, in the railways, dock workers, mine workers, and very important, unlike the rest of the world, unlike in Europe, for example, the trade unions did not emerge first in industry or in the industrial sector. The industrial sector followed much later, and so did agriculture and other fields that are not as important. This is partly a function of the fact that many of these African economies are mainly natural resource-based, and industry has historically been very small. But in countries such as South Africa and, 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 and Zimbabwe, Namibia, Nigeria, where industry emer did emerge, African workers form, formed trade unions much later in those sectors. What were the issues that animated workers and made them join trade unions? Now let's look at these issues. The first one is the issue of wages. Now under colonialism, the issue of wages is very important because colonial economies were low wage economies. They were based on low wages, they were based on super exploitation. Now, the second issue that was very important is the issue of humiliation of workers, the loss of dignity, if you like. And one example that I like to make in that, in, in that regard is that of Durban in the early years of the 20th century, where newly arrived workers from the villages, from the rural areas, were taken through a process of disinfectant. They were put through disinfectants to, before they could be employed in the city, before they could be allowed to live in the city. That's what, they were, they, they, that, that's what was, was done to them. And of course, the other issue that's very important is the issue of discrimination. In some cases, racial discrimination. In other areas, um, ethnic discrimination and favoritism. Very important here, I'm not mentioning the issue of gender because women joined African trade unions much later on. In the beginning, it was mainly male workers and mainly migrant workers too, some of them moving back and forth uh, in between contracts, between their villages, their rural areas, and, uh, and the towns and mining areas. The other issue, of course, very important, is the issue of lack of trade union rights. Again, you know, it's very interesting that even though the immigrant workers were allowed from the beginning to form trade unions and be and organize and, and bargain on, 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 on the, for themselves, black workers were not allowed from the beginning to do that. 
And so this became another source of grievance, and therefore it, it was a trigger of many uh, uh, industrial protests. The lack of political rights is, a, is an overarching issue that covers all that connects all these issues that I'm talking about. And remember, this was during colonialism and many of these workers did not have the right to form, uh, to, rather, they did not have political citizenship. Right. And of course, the issue of health and safety is very important too. You had, had a horrible kind of situations and, and, and circumstances in these, in these workplaces where it was dangerous, it was unsafe. Uh, it was dangerous, for example, if you look at some of the mines, huge open cast mines, if you look at some of the mines, deep uh, uh, underground mines in Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Namibia, and so on and so forth, very dangerous, very unsafe. And many workers died, and this always triggered some uh, protests as well. So this is kind of, in short, uh, the, the, the set of issues that made workers join uh, uh, tr trade unions in, in Africa. And, we can, we, we, and you can take it across the continent, regardless of country. Now, the next question, therefore, if that was the set of issues under colonialism, the next question uh, uh, that one would ask is, what did they do you know, about fighting for independence? Um, there's been a debate, there is a debate about, or, or rather there was a debate about the role of, of African trade unions and African workers in the struggle for independence. Some were arguing that trade unions did not play a role, but that debate has now been settled. Everyone agrees that trade unions did participate in, 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 in political struggles towards independence. And of course the important thing about, to understand about those struggles is that it did not always show or manifest itself as a political, uh, of political actions. Sometimes workplace struggles very easily kind of translated and graduated into political struggles. And so uh, it's very important to kind of take note of that, that what is political and what was industrial, if you like, was always kind of fused into one, one set of difficult issues. And so workplaces were all, all also, workplace struggles, therefore, were also political struggles. Now, the reason in the mind of workers, the reason why this, there was this close association between the two was because there was also a close association between employers and the state. They worked hand in glove. They worked very, very closely. And so workers also realized that there's no way that you can deal with employers without the state getting drawn in, in, the, in, those, in those things. Very important a point to make at this point, that violence, uh, violence was a feature of colonialism. Everywhere, it was, it, was, it, was, it was violence. I mean, look at Mozambique, for example, the issue of forced labor in Mozambique. Violence was the main driver, was the main driver, and was the main method to, to engage workers and to make sure that workers perform. And so it was, it was therefore, for that reason, that uh, um, you have this close association. Very important point to make at this point that trade unions in Africa acted as incubators for future political leadership uh, on the continent. And, and, and again, this runs across the continent from Southern Africa, Central Africa, and, and, and West Africa. If you look at Kenya, for example, Tom Boyer was a, was a trade unionist first before he became a political leader. If you look at Zimbabwe, Joshua Nkomo was a, a trade unionist before he became a political leader. And, and so the list goes on and on and on in other parts uh, of the country. You can look at Namibia as a, as a case. Right. Once independence was achieved, what was the fate of trade unions and trade unionism? Did they, how, how did they manage? How did they fare in the post-independence period? How did they fare in the post-independence period? Frederick Cooper has, 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 has kind of argued that um, one of the key features of the new political elites uh, in charge of the state in the post-colonial period was their fear of an intolerance of trade unions because they saw trade unions as a potential alternative center of power and therefore could be used to mobilize opposition. And, and therefore, the new elite tried to close down opportunities for, for trade unions to operate independently of the state. The idea was to always control them to make sure that they could be tame, they, they, could, they were tame and that they could be controlled in various ways. So, but the point is this, notwithstanding all of that, the early years were good. 
the early years of, of the post-independence period were, were very good for trade unions. They, um, they made some gains. They made some gains. Uh, and the gains were in the area of, of provision of services. Union members, like other members of society, uh, be benefited uh, from the expansion of education, the expansion of, of health care, uh, full employment, and so on and so forth. And one example I, I, I would uh, always give is, is that of the education system, where you had free education, school and university, free education at that level. And many of these countries, you, you moved from a situation where there was scarcity of educated people to, to a situation where there was a surplus of people to the extent that they moved out. And look at Ghana, for example. By the time, uh, by 1966, the time Nkrumah is overthrown, there was a thick layer of an educated class that had emerged, and that was a product of this expansion of education. You look at Nigeria similarly, and, 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 and you can look at other countries too. So that, those were some of the benefits for, for, for society, including trade unions, including trade union members. Now, the important point here, therefore, is that if there was this attempt by the state to control trade unions, the state was also delivering, it was also providing. So there's a kind of a trade-off that one sees here, where the state says, okay, we have a duty to govern, we are now the government, and we have a duty to, to, to ensure development, and we'll provide these services, but in return, Leave, us, leave politics to us. Leave politics, you concentrate on the shop floor. That kind of trade-off. And trade unions played along in many countries. Some conflicts, of course, some conflicts, uh, but not as significant. But the main thing was the trade-off the, the trade did hold for me in, in many countries. But of course, I should also mention that the tension was, was, it never disappeared, even in those cases where there was provision. Look at, for example, Tanzania under Nyerere. Nyerere, very well respected, or highly respected, and highly regarded leader in Tanzania. Um, he didn't like trade, union, uh, trade unions to be independent from the party. He wanted them to be subservient to the party, and he always lectured them about that, that their role was to ensure development, and that the state had a duty, and they should kind of confine themselves to the shop floor and to industrial issues. And so, those are some of the conflicts that were there, but it was, all in all, it was a, a kind of system where there was some kind of equilibrium, some kind of trade-off, some kind of balance was achieved. In, if you look at the 1960s, for example, that was the case. The early 1970s, maybe first two years, it was the same thing. But then the trouble start in the 1970s. Trouble start in the 1970s because suddenly, many African economies, as was the case with other economies elsewhere, they went through difficult times. The difficult times were because of the changing kind of global kind of political uh, uh, economy. In the 1970s, the oil crisis, the drop of, of, of prices of commodities, and many of these economies were, were reliant on commodities. Uh, uh, oil, for example, in West Africa, Nigeria, by that time they had oil, uh, copper, um, and other minerals, gold, and so on and so forth. And suddenly the prices kind of became very difficult, it, it, very difficult to sustain the prices that they had previously. That's, that, that's one thing. So, what was done then in response to this crisis was basically to readjust the economies, what was then called the structural adjustment policies. The IMF came in, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank came in and kind of forced these, these countries to go through these changes. And if you like, these are the beginnings of neoliberalism. You know, way, way before, you know, what we talk about today, you know, with Greece and other, you know, and other difficulties in Europe. It started here. These countries went through difficult times. And of course, what, what happened was then pressure to privatize privatized state corporations. And one example very st that stands out uh, ab about privatization is, 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 um, is, 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 that, is that many of these economies had a very large state sector. Zambia, the state sector was 80% of the entire economy. The state owned hotels, it owned farms, it, ain it owned restaurants, and it owned the mines, everything. And if you privatize that, 
the number of workers is going to be reduced inevitably, and of course trade unions are going to lose their membership. And so the public sector was particularly hard to hit, therefore, by these programs. And another thing that's related to all of these changes in the economies, of course, was the issue of removal of subsidies. Now, subsidies are important here. Look at what's happening uh, recently, uh, what happened recently in Nigeria. You know, as soon as the state re removed the, the, the subsidy on oil, oil prices and petrol prices went up. The same thing happened in these countries in the early period where the subsidies were removed, prices skyrocketed, and so conflict started because people no longer had access to these subsidies and prices went high and many of people, the people had no jobs and so on and so forth. And many of the social wage provisions were removed. So the question then is what did the unions do about it? Did they sit back? And consider, considering that many unions had lost membership, had lost power, they were kind of very, had been reduced into very, very small trade unions, well, trade unions fought back. Trade unions fought back in many, many ways, and they've been f fighting back ever since. And how did they, what did they fight against exactly? Well, they fought against these programs. In other words, they fought directly. That put them in confrontation with the state. They also fought against state authoritarianism. Because by then, the, 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 the trade-off was gone. For the first time, people said, we need opposition parties. We need multi-party politics. And that became an issue, an issue on the agenda for, for protesters. And of course, the issue of restriction of trade union rights was also a trigger for the opposition. And unions worked together with civil society. But in, on the continent in general, with a few exceptions, South Africa perhaps, and a couple of other countries, most countries have very thin layers of civil society kind of organization, very low densities of civil society bodies. And so the church in many cases came to play a very important role, a different kind of church in its Christian church in its different kind of manifestations play, came to play a very important role. Funding organizations from outside came to play a very important role. Outside funding came to play a very important role too in the, in the fight back by unions. And some of these unions formed opposition parties and we can talk about it. And some of them were formed much earlier on, such as in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, and more recently in Nigeria, for example, the Democratic Labour Party. All of, all of those are instances. Um, the issue then, and that many people always ask, is what happened then once these pro-union parties were in power? Did it benefit unions? Did it benefit union members at all? And the question is, in most cases, no, they did not. Many of them turned their backs on trade unions. They abandoned trade unions as soon as they were in power. That's one of the puzzles about, about African politics in recent times. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. I could talk about other things uh, when, when it comes to African trade unions. I can, I can talk about them in terms of global, their global interconnections and so on and so forth, but I prefer to end it here. Thank you very much for listening.